The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark in the seventh chapter. Listen now for God's word to you. Now when the Pharisees gathered together to Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they purify themselves. And there are many other traditions which they observe, the washing of cups and pots and vessels of bronze. And the Pharisees and the scribes said to Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with hands defiled? And he said to them, How well did Isaiah prophesy, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines, the precepts of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold fast to the tradition of men. And he called the people and again said to them, Hear me, all of you, understand there is nothing outside a person which by going into that person can defile. But the things which defile a person are the things that come out of the heart. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? Now, I learned something interesting yesterday. This has nothing to do with the text. It's kind of a separate little thing. But I found it uh, quite interesting. There's an NPR program on Saturday called What Do You Know? And they had, they usually get uh, former stars or uh, well-known celebrities to answer three questions. And they called on Brooke Shields, who used to model Calvin Klein jeans when she was young. So their questions had to do with names like Calvin. And, they, and, and it surprised me that they said the best known Calvin was John Calvin, which I thought, wow, that's interesting. And so they asked old Brooks there, uh, how did John Calvin die? A, he drowned. B, he blew up. C, he fell down the stairs and broke his neck. Well, she answered, uh, in a way that was wrong. And the answer to that, I wonder how many of us know. The answer was he blew up. While he was preaching, he had a massive stroke and died. I just thought that little tidbit, as I say prayer, I hope that I don't blow up this morning. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten not only our minds, but our hearts that we might receive the fullness of Christ. Amen. Jonathan Swift, an Irish clergyman, an author, a satirist of the 18th century, wrote a book that so many of us have known and loved, Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver is shipwrecked on 
in the land of the Lilliputians. And he is a giant. And after they get used to him, that he would do the Lilliputians no harm, Gulliver begins to notice some of their strange customs. Customs that often ended in violence. There were, on one hand, the big-ended Lilliputians, and the small-ended Lilliputians. The kingdom seemed to be divided by the big enders who said the only way you can crack an egg properly is crack it from the big end. And on the other hand, the little enders that said there was only one way to crack the egg from the little end. And they fought and often to the death. The Swift's Satire and commentary was about the absurdity over which human beings fight and often maim and kill each other. The gospel this morning addresses something which at first seems to be absurd. The clean handers of the Pharisees and the scribes and the dirty handers, Jesus' disciples. Now, the Pharisees have been understood as the eternal spoil sports of the Bible, the nitpickers of the first century. The scribes were the lawyers, and they were as equally narrow-minded, we think. And they put forth, you should always wash before you eat. To eat with unwashed hands was against God. And we're probably thinking this sounds just like Gulliver's Travels. What is the big deal? Before we are too quick to trivialize the concern of the Pharisees, I think we need to attempt to understand them. The Pharisees' theological perspective began 600 years before Jesus was born. The Jews believed they were chosen by God, and only they were chosen by God. They believed that God would never let them down. They believed that the home base of God was Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Thus, God would never, ever let anything happen to Jerusalem. For the temple and Jerusalem was the basis of the Jewish faith. The year was 587 BCE. Jerusalem, in fact, fell to the Babylonians and the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple. And then they came in, as Babylonians are wont to do, they took off the leaders, the teachers, the educators, and took them into captivity in Babylon. For 50 years, those people in a foreign country had to ponder what all of this meant. Many of them no longer believed, but for those who believed, they were asking questions about their assumptions. What is it that we had done wrong? We must have failed God in some way. And then finally they asked the pertinent question. What does God think is important 
about the way we live our lives. Now the prophet Isaiah proposed one answer to the question. The Jews, he said, had become isolated from the rest of the world, thinking that only they mattered. God only cared about them. Isaiah proposed that the Jews should be involved in the problems and the pain in the world. The Jews should be champions of justice and equity and be filled with a compassionate heart. But there were two other prophets that differed, Ezra and Nehemiah. God's interest they said, was in purity and keeping people undefiled by keeping them away from the world. God's call was avoidance to be involved with Gentiles, those who were not Jews. God's call was not to engagement, but isolation. Well, the Ezra folks and the Nehemiah folks won the argument. God wanted the Jews separated. God wanted pure and spotless people undefiled by Gentiles. As a matter of fact, the word Pharisee, which we have often heard, means the separated one. Now, over the years, the Jewish lawyers developed a system of rules. These rules were based upon practical reason, and they defined what a true believer does and what a true believer does not do. Thus, we come up to the rules of washing the hands, or how many steps one could take on the Sabbath day without breaking the command to remember the Sabbath and keep it separate. The point is, the Pharisees truly thought they were following God in every facet of their lives. Enter Jesus Jesus puts on the prophetic mantle of Isaiah. The first sermon Jesus ever preached, it is significant that he preached from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've been anointed to preach good news to the poor, bind up the broken-hearted Preach to the captives, restore the sight to the blind, and set those free who suffer. And what he was in fact saying to the scribes and the Pharisees is that you have made the wrong choice. You've made the wrong choice about what really is significant in what God wants of you. Now, Jesus would never say that personal morality didn't matter. But to stop at that point was to miss the heart and the soul of the law. There are some scholars who believe the Pharisees' religion was at its root a religion of fear. They derived their energy from the fear of breaking one of those rules. If one part of the law is broken, then the tradition may die. And if the tradition dies, then the faith dies. Jesus said, I come to set the captives free. I wonder how much of Christianity needs to be set free from the fear 
of God. And God in Christ. This week I was pondering this thought. How many people came to Jesus out of fear? I could not recall a single one who came out of fear. They came because they knew he loved them. There are two responses, and we all know this, to fear, fight or flight. Maybe it's true the ones that were afraid of Jesus didn't even show up at all. But the ones who were in a fight with Jesus, they were afraid. That is the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, one might say the scribes and the Pharisees were afraid of losing their power, and that might be true. But I wonder, I wonder if their real fear was the gut-wrenching fear that they might be wrong. You see, being wrong, our entire system collapses, doesn't it? Oh, I will put up many, many defenses to defend my stance against being wrong. I climb up in this pulpit approximately, gosh, 96 times a year. Counting both services. And I have to tell you, I know the fear of being wrong very well. What if the preacher is wrong? One day I was going through some old files, which, uh, and I wanted to throw some out, and I stumbled across these old sermons. And there was no emergency happening, so I started reading some of those old, old sermons. Oh my, I thought, how could I have said that? I was, it's hard for me to say the word, wrong. Well, try harder to get it right. And every Saturday, starting about midday, I would be a nervous wreck because every Sunday was another chance for me to stand up here and be wrong. I heard someone come up to see our pre say to me, our preacher is an anointed one. Well, I knew they weren't talking about me. I guess what anointed means is that they agree with everything that that preacher says, and that preacher says it with authority. I, I don't understand the term. But I have learned two things in 35 years of preaching. One is that there is no perfect sermon outside of Jesus Christ. Two is that fear of being wrong is ultimately about the preacher's pride. You see, every single one who speaks At this hour of the day is a mortal. And everyone who speaks tries to put together some theological structure, but if, if they are wrong, that structure crumbles and you are stuck reworking it. 
Oh, we will be wrong. That is the story of human nature, and my friends, that is the story of the Bible. About us, all of us, in our relationship with God. I think Jesus loves Isaiah's book so much because when Isaiah receives his call into the ministry to be a prophet, it is in the sixth chapter, it was the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the Lord's train filled the entire temple. And Isaiah, what did he say? Did he say, goody for me, now I've seen God, the rest of them haven't. No, what he said is, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. And you could say, I am a man that is wrong, speaks wrongly. And I dwell in the midst of a people that so often is wrong with me. I have to be honest to tell you, so often I sit down here hidden before I have to get up here. And about the best prayer I can offer is, Oh, God, bless this mess. The conflict with the Pharisees and Jesus is not a Lilliputian conflict. It is every human being's conflict. It is the conflict of any religion that is driven by fear. For fear always contains bondage. But Jesus came to set us free from that bondage. The Savior would come and set us free. Come unto me all that you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we, when we are able to hear that, we can lay our burdens down. It is for people like you and me who are wrong. From time to time, that Christ died. I believe in my heart of hearts that Jesus spent so much time doing verbal fencing with the Pharisees because he wanted the Pharisees to come to lay their burdens down in a place of peace. The text, another text says that Jesus was like a mother hen trying to gather all the chicks under her wings. But they would not come. Why? Because it meant laying down their pride. The deadliest of all sin. Why? Because pride ultimately kills the soul. But that's not what God brings to us. Perfect love cast out fear. Today, we should celebrate a God that loves us. Not one that scares us into submission, but one who cares for us into submission. For therein is life and peace at last. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.